Okay. So I want to go in this little box that I put together. What I think are the big advantages and disadvantages? Obviously, um, we like it because we it's easier to do a single position surgery. It means like you can do multiple approaches in one single position. So specifically, you can manage the anterior column, anterior column support, and at the same time, access the posterior column in the, I will call in the most, most natural way to do surgery for us as a spine surgeon, that is with the patient in prone position. You know, all of us grew up with a patient in prone position. That's the natural way to uh, uh, access the spine, all the laminectomies, everything comes from that. Second, which is very important, is the direction of technically on the spine. As we know, all the enabling technologies is where the spine is going right now. And prone position fits perfectly navigation, robotics, so forth, because it's the more stable position that we can put the human being in terms of prevent um, problems with the motion, which, I, which we know that navigation and robotics and uh, augmented reality, they're relying 100% on having the patient fixed on, 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 on a unique plane. However, it comes with significant disadvantages. You know, so the ergonomics are very complicated because you have to work sitting. And uh, even if you rotate the patient away from you, it makes immediately makes your orientation change. So you're not anymore working parallel to the floor of the OR or perpendicular to the walls of the room. So your mind starts becoming a little complicated. That's why uh, I'm a big believer that, for example, the prone lateral version of the lateral surgery, I will say navigation is almost a must on, on this variation, as I'll show you later on. However, you can do it with x-ray absolutely with no problems. And then obviously, uh, nobody can deny the, the big value of specifically the a leaf at the L5-S1. So doing an L5-S1 in prone position, uh, I, say, I think is very challenging. Uh, I know that, you know, how's everything in life. I'm sure that someone is going to end up doing a living prone. I want to see how they're going to do it. But as per today, I can imagine doing an A living prone position. And we know that 5 1 probably the best approach for 5 1 is on through A leaf. So uh, that's basically what I think on this. So uh, Shiraz showed his experience on anatomical dissections. And uh, over the last, uh, I would say, two and a half years, we're doing this extensive uh, imaging study, thanks to uh, some grants that we get at our institution. Basically, we get uh, voluntary participants and we put them at least uh, one hour each on the coil mm -hmm. on the a, um, investigational uh, MRI machines. And we uh, perform MRIs in multiple positions. As you see here, lateral with the flex hips, lateral with the uh, hip extended, prone position with hip flex, prone position with hip extended. And we also look at the uh, not only how the muscle migrate and all the structures in the retroperitoneum, but also we look at uh, the three-dimensional shaping of the muscle, how the volume, the, volum the, the volumetric measures of the psoas muscle change. And, and we find out, that's to make the long story short, this is a paper that will be published around two, three months on the European Journal of Spine, which uh, showed that basically when the patient is in prone position with the hip extended, basically the classic position that the patient adopts on the OSI table without the sling, that's when the uh, psoas muscle migrate the most posterior, which is very interesting is there is very little, as you see here, between the prone, you see the, the location of the psoas with relation to the vertebras on the prone with the hip extended compared to supine is almost the same, which is a great news because it means that the MRI that you have preoperative on your patient is going to be very close of the uh, images that you're gonna have when you put your patient in prone position. As compared, when, when you see the image in here on the left, it, this is the patient with the classic lateral position. You see how the psoas had this tendency to migrate anterior compared, for example, to the supine of the prone. Um, images. So, um, so the, the basically that's the, that was the uh, kind of the big conclusion of this paper in terms of the uh, psoas uh, migration 
which you see that supine and prone is basically the same, which is in the favor of moving the lumbar plexus more posterior. It doesn't mean that you're not gonna have lumbar plexus injuries. You still will have it. And I experienced it already, you know, a lumbar plexus injury, one of my patients trying to push the, the on, on transitional levels. So again, so there is some unique features of the prone lateral approach. And you have to take this one with you home because these are the two big difference and principles on prone lateral surgery. One is, don't forget, gravity is king. So everything you put, as Shiraz mentioned, likes to move anterior. So your retractor will always try to go to the floor. Everything likes to go anterior and don't forget, you don't want to hit nothing anterior. You have the vessels. You don't want to do an intentional anterior column release, what we call ACRs, because you can end up in a big problem. So first thing that you have to always think is make sure that your retractor is not going anterior. It doesn't matter how many shims you use. Once you start distracting the levels, it doesn't matter if you fix it with the screws to the vertebra, the retractor always will try to move anterior. You know, specifically when you put the patient on prone that give you this nice um, lordosis axis. And then uh, the second principle is that everything likes to go superficial. So your game is how can I keep the retractor deep and posterior. If you keep that one in your mind, it's gonna be very low chances that you're gonna have these bad placements of the cages or these, uh, I will say, catastrophic complication, which is the vascular injuries. That is when the surgeon lose control of the case and go more anterior. So um, from here, I'm gonna show you two cases. One of the cases is perform 100% of the fluoroscopy. The other one is assisted with navigation. And I want you to make your own conclusions. And uh, you, as you will see, they, they can work very good, but I can tell you that uh, the prone lateral, I will say is a little more challenging the lateral surgery as it is. I'm still not 100% sure because obviously I'm doing thousands of uh, lateral access with the patient on lateral and I'm may, maybe close to hundreds on the uh, prone lateral, but I can tell that it's a little more challenging on the prone lateral. So the first patient you're seeing here is a patient with moderate, moderate uh, adult spinal deformity with a not too bad uh, sagittal um, parameter. You see here, we apply the gap score that usually is very generous on, on this kind of patients show that it's a moderate disproportion, but in the real life is, is actually almost uh, patient balance in terms of uh, no, parameter. You see here, it has a significant holisthesis on four five. Uh, there is a small low uh, coronal deformity, and obviously there is a uh, lack of uh, lordosis at that levels. This is the MRI pre-op, as you see the classic uh, MRI of the patient with adult spinal deformity with some stenosis, in this case, a little bit of spondylolisthesis for five and uh, so forth. On the uh, CT pre-op, again, the olisthesis in four five, the a bone in bone at uh, L3, um, L2, L3. And then you see a little bit of the focal uh, loss of lordosis at two, three, as well as four five. And so we, we get focus on these two levels, uh, we can get good correction of the lordosis and good work. So in this case, for example, is a, I would say is a perfect uh, opportunity for the prone lateral. It was a patient without big uh, body habitus, which if I am able to access prone, I mean, posterior and lateral at the same time, I can have a lot of saving. This is just the bone density. We show that she has a good bone. This is um, going to be a little bit more uh, technical that she has in here. So I can give you some uh, technique uh, nuances of the procedure as we do it right now. Uh, I want to mention to you that uh, any lateral access system should be able to do prone lateral. So I am a big believer that uh, this procedure is not a unique. This is just a modification of the lateral access and every system in the world, lateral should be able to perform perfectly a prone lateral. You just need to get used to that. So you see here in this case, I'm not using any sophisticated bed uh, um, 
uh, systems. I'm using a regular Jackson table. And then between taping and, and moving the legs sideways, you can open that window between the 12 rib and the Leah crest. And then you mark your incision as you see here, uh, regular like in lateral. And then you open your incision, dissect the abdominal muscles as normally. You find your retroperitoneum. You get your entry point on the psoas muscle, as you see here. In this case, you're trying to negotiate the way to make your wire through the olestesis. Then, as you see here, the ergonomics are not the best. You see, I'm working sitting, extending my neck. However, I'm doing it because I know the time savings when time comes to do the posterior approach. And you see here, um, you do your first level. Then you go over the second level, same process. Uh, you put your retractor, you find the lumbar plexus, you do your carpentry, put your uh, retractor. And then the difference in here is that L2, L3, which was a, a focal kyphotic area, what I decided is, and the vessels were in a favored position in terms of dissect the anterior longitudinal ligament, I perform a, an ACR, I cut the ligament, put a 15 degrees lordotic cage, and I gained the lordosis that I was trying to gain without the need to do osteotomies. As you see here, once you do the lateral, then you do your percutaneous screws, and you see here, you put your uh, system as whatever percutaneous system you like to use. And then as you see here, the difference between before and after CT to CT, you see that, for example, that level give us a good lordosis. L4, L5, we were able to maintain or give a little more. The olestesis definitely disappeared and the a big a coronal uh, imbalance was now uh, corrected. And this is the MRI post-op again, uh, indirect decompression, working similar to the picture of Shiraz. As we know, we are big believers on indirect decompression. All the posterior elements are preserved, as you see here, all the spinous process, all the interspinal ligament, everything else. So um, good option in, in, in this type of patient.